Salam and welcome back to Somali Dispatch, SomaliDispatch.com. My name is Abdi Qadir Gulen. Dr. Abdurrahman Mohamed Hashi is the chairman of Badba the Qaran Party and is currently one of Somalia's numerous presidential candidates. He was the former Minister of Fisheries and Marine Source Resources of uh, the Federal Republic of Somalia from 2017 to 2018. He was also the Secretariat of the Economic Committee of the Council of Ministers at the same period. The Tarhashi believes he offers the leadership the country currently needs due to his experience and broad education in finance and economics from U.S. universities like George Mason University, Job Hopkins, and from the Peace University. He joins us from Virginia, USA. Abdurrahman Mahmoud Hashi, uh, welcome to SomaliDispatch.com. Thank you for your time and accepting our invitation today to talk about your candidacy. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, honor for me to join your program. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, you know, um, if you can give us a, a, a start us off with a brief uh, introduction um, to the Badakaran party and uh, what it stands for and how it came about, it would be great. Okay, as you know, uh, the National Independent Election Commission was formed in Somalia. And at the beginning of the Ormaji administration, uh, they were registering political parties throughout the, uh, on a national level. And uh, if I am correct, it's approximately over 100 political parties are officially registered with the National Independent Election Commission. And our party is one of those uh, parties that registered meeting all the requirements to be uh, given that status as a political party. And we are represented by people from all parts of the country, or uh, in other words, all the representation throughout the country. So that's our founders and also we have the executive committee. So that's how our party is, it's a diverse party. And Badbada Karan really stands for uh, almost uh, the correct word is National Restoration Party is the right word. And we think Somalia needs really a new birth and to start fresh. And that's what we mean by the no, Sounds good. Um, can you then give us a, a brief assessment of uh, the, the situation the country is currently in, uh, be it security, economically, and the overall uh, situation of the country? Uh, the country, as you know, is in a very, uh, really precarious or difficult position now. We are getting ready for the elections, which or really it's not election, but selection, uh, which will take place uh, hopefully by the end of this year, if everything goes well, or maybe before that. Uh, we will see. We miss so many deadlines. It's hard to know what time is it going to happen. But within the coming couple of months, we hope the uh, the election or selection will take place. Uh, as you know, uh, because of the um, uh, arguments and all the political infighting because of the preparation for the election, and there were uh, fighting between some of the opposition group and the Armaja government, and we almost came to the brink of civil war, and God, that has been really uh, averted. And uh, so, we are in a very difficult position. We hope now things are reasonably stable in terms of the economy in general, the COVID-19 problem is a real challenge in Somalia. The government really has failed in my point of view. Whatever resources, meager resources they could get, they have never explained it to the public what their strategy is or what they are planning to do. They don't inform the public. The rest of the world, their governments issue regularly, you know, statements, what's going on by region, by whatever. We don't have a national uh, committee for the uh, COVID chaired by the president or the prime minister that regularly, you know, explains to the people. So in terms of the economy is very weak because of the uh, lockdown and all the other uh, unemployment related to that, and also the health challenge. Um, so overall, we are just, uh, in a very difficult position and we hope uh, we can finish this election without any further uh, uh, bloodshed or any further uh, uh, infightings. Um, before I ask you about uh, some of your 
uh, proposed um, solutions to the country's uh, immense problems. Um, as, as we know, the selection of the upper house um, members um, have uh, somewhat concluded right now. Uh, could you tell us, this? there has been a lot of questions uh, surrounding that. Can you give us a reaction to um, how do you uh, see the way it uh, unfolded in front of the public? Uh, I think if I start from the end, as you know, there's a, there's a large outcry throughout the country about the uh, process for the election of the Senate. Uh, people knew this is an indirect election. People knew there will always be, it will not be as transparent as people would like or as free as people would like, but people expected certain minimum, basic minimum level of uh, trust that they could have in the process. The constitution allows or the understanding or the agreement allows the regional governments to nominate who the candidates would be for the Senate. And people expect also the parliament of each region will vote for these senators. But people expecting that the president, whatever the region might be, will nominate two or three people candidates that really are formidable candidates. That people, when they look at their uh, credentials and their background, they will say these are people of worthy of being a senator. So, and then uh, the election takes place, but it's still, it gives the uh, opportunity for the leaders of the regions at least to have a shape to a certain extent who the likely candidates might be who come out of that. But what happened really was that there were no really uh, uh, competitive elections you know, really that took place. Most of the candidates, as you know, uh, they, uh, they, their, their challengers withdraw the last minute before any you know, elections really uh, took place or selection take place. So people were extremely disappointed. And uh, uh, that also really, uh, people were very, very worried about that the 2016 election, I don't know if you recall, were really uh, permeated by uh, injustice and huge corruption. So we were hoping that we will make at least some progress and make an improvement of what we had 2016. But there is a wide consensus now that 2021 is actually a lot worse than 2016. So it's not a good start, but uh, they, we just have to deal with the reality or the hand that's dealt with the Somali people. And people are expecting now the other election for the People's Parliament or 275 MPs for the lower house would be reasonably fair and also reasonably uh, also competitive. And, uh, and transparent. Uh, and people are hoping that the traditional elders who are the key stakeholders who will play a role would be respected and given an opportunity given what happened in the Senate. And that's the expectation. And based on what I have seen on the media for the last couple of days, it's obvious that people are really saying uh, the prime minister is the really the person who's in charge of the election and he should uh, assert himself because if the lower house also goes the way the uh, Senate went, uh, the question that will really be uh, everybody's mind is, what would be the result of the election? Would there be confidence on the outcome of the election? And that's the worst thing that can happen, an outcome that the Somali people don't see as legitimate. And uh, that could have implication for the government and what they can do and their governing and their agenda. And I think the stakes are very high and I am very uh, concerned that uh, uh, the leaders and the prime minister uh, is not really paying the attention it deserves. He's traveling now, he's in uh, Egypt, he was in Kenya. The number one job of the prime minister was to make sure this election uh, is done as best as possible, as free as possible. And if he is now traveling while this is his number one agenda, that's really a, a cause for concern. But I hope uh, I'm wrong on this uh, pessimistic view, uh, but I hope uh, things will, uh, will be much better uh, in the coming elections. Um, and as you correctly pointed out, um, the Somali people are looking 
to uh, their leaders and, uh, and, and their leaders to come up with solutions to the multitude of problems uh, that the country has been facing the last few decades. Um, let's start with security. What are your uh, plans in, in tackling that major issue in Somalia? Well, uh, I see about uh, five really key challenges facing Somalia. In my view, Somalia is at a critical crossroad. And whichever way Somalia goes will have uh, strong implications and ramifications. Uh, the, in my view, uh, we think that the last uh, three or four governments really have not addressed the real challenges facing this country even though there are marginal, marginal improvements on a few areas, but the key challenging issues have not been addressed. So start with security. Security is the number one issue really facing the country. And uh, the regime that its term has just expired, uh, they were supposed to uh, really put their focus on the security issue. There was a London agreement, the National Security Architectures in London, and they were supposed to work in together with the regions, uh, make an improvement and prepare for the plan of transitioning from Amazon and the Somali National Army taking over really the responsibility of really uh, uh, you know, securing the country. And that agenda really is now agreed by all uh, parties that it has failed clearly so far. And in my view, the major reason why it failed is leadership. And I think it's on the hands, uh, you can put on the feet of the president uh, whose term has expired. Instead of working with the regions, the president embarked on a very aggressive and unconstitutional problem, uh, agenda of trying to destabilize the regions, try to choose who the, who the leaders for those regions would be. And the reason why he's doing that and did a lot of bloodshed is he wants to be reelected. His personal agenda, his personal ambition is what is driving his agenda. So that is very unfortunate. So all the resources and the military and all of that uh, security issues went out of the window. And we are focusing on infightings with regional, uh, you know, some of the regions. So that is the most unfortunate. The other issue that also is a key problem for the security is the uh, National uh, Intelligence Security Agency is now almost really non-existent. It has been totally infiltrated by Al-Shabaab. It is not playing the role it's supposed to play. So we don't have the military and we don't have the intelligence agency. So we are almost uh, really uh, uh, in a very uh, difficult position despite all these problems, it is very commendable uh, the uh, heroic efforts of the Somali National Army by Danab and also uh, Ramad and also Gorgor. They are making major inroads. If you are following the news, they are really uh, in different parts of the country. They are, um, they are uh, really uh, uh, taking over many, many areas from Al Shabaab. And with all those challenges, can you imagine if the government would have put more resources, more focusing on fighting al-Shabaab, we would have done a really tremendous change. So my bottom line really on the security is we want a new government that will make that issue really a number one priority. Uh, rebuild the army, uh, the Turks and the United States government uh, have been uh, really uh, very, very supportive and they have built uh, uh, very uh, uh, credible forces for commandos. And if we build on that, and also we put the resources that we need in terms of uh, giving them the morale, and giving them uh, uh, what we call, uh, uh, pay them well and give them their uh, camps where they are. And uh, uh, so all of these issues needs to be taken care of. Um, the other issue really that's very important is, it's, it's important that the uh, leaders have a vision of what they want to do, and they are also uh, going to implement that in a way that is clear. What I, what, that, what I mean by that is they have to 
have a leaders that they selected carefully for the security forces, that they should not change them every six months. If you change them every six months, the commanders of the military, then every uh, six months you are starting from ground zero. So uh, that is really a leadership issue and a focus of that. The other issue also related to that is, it is very widely uh, really now shared among Somalis that Amazon is no longer playing the role it's supposed to play, which was to assist and also support the Somali National Army in terms of taking over new areas from Al-Shabaab. I was just watching the news yesterday and I saw the governor of Iran region publicly addressing the media and saying that they have been talking to the Amazon forces to support them in terms of all the fighting going on in Iran and that region. But they have been unable to do that. And he was saying, what is the purpose of Amazon? Can anybody tell us why Amazon is not uh, working with us in terms of really what's going on there? So that's another issue about uh, Amazon. And that issue really has to be looked at by the future government and the international community working together. There has to be a plan of handing over to the Somali National Army, but Amazon has to reform or has to change the agenda or some other way of really addressing this issue has to come to fore. So I will leave it there. And the National Police Force is doing well. They have trained them and they are really in a more capacity has been really, they get a lot of equipment and a lot of training. Uh, the final point is in terms of recruiting for the security forces is somewhat a little bit lopsided and we need to have a national recruitment plan throughout the country, the traditional way that we used to do, and also recruit new people from different parts of the country in an equitable and a fair and transparent way. That way we could have a national cohesion and a, an army that really is a national army. Uh, that's my view on national security. Appreciate and, you know, that, we, appreciate that, Dr. Abdurrahman, and your uh, extensive explanation in some of the critical issues the country is facing. To have a, a cohesion, a national cohesion, there has to be some sort of a, a, a well thought out, planned out, implemented reconciliation among Somalis. Uh, and you've explained how the current president uh, perhaps uh, contributed negatively to that uh, effort. So. What sort of a, a reconciliation uh, would you um, implement or are you thinking of? And we've known what you know, top-down solutions have been uh, for Somalis. Uh, it hasn't really accomplished a lot, one would say. Um, would you consider other sorts of, of uh, reconciliations? Yes, I think uh, that is the right word. Really, there has never been a genuine and a credible a national reconciliation effort undertaken in Somalia. You need to, it's a very extensive process. It's a difficult process, but it has to be started early in the process at the beginning of a new administration. As you know, if we want to have one person, one vote election, 25 or 26, I don't know what the time will be for the next government. You, you have to go to regions and towns and also uh, through villages and districts. And the only way you can do that is if you have a national reconciliation and Somalis uh, uh, need to uh, appoint a national reconciliation commission that's credible, that is represented by people who are respected throughout the country, very diverse, very well respected, independent from the government, but with a clear mandate, clear mandate what they're expected to do and they have to uh, go to the regions and address wherever there are uh, really unresolved issues or disputes and come up also with another agenda or another plan, which is to do somewhat a reasonable consensus or I mean, census uh, or, or estimate the people who are there in those regions, how many seats or, or parliament will come from a particular district or region. And it has to be fair and equitable. That's a very, very, uh, a detailed process that requires resources and it requires also a lot of effort. And that has to be one of the top agenda for the new government. In my candidacy and our political party, that's really a very important agenda for us. And without that, uh, and it has to look credible and genuine. It should not be a government, uh, uh, you know, um, a government manipulated process 
that people should see it as a transparent process. You have to give a progress report and their eventual recommendation should be sent back to parliament and it has to be uh, supported by the parliament and not on a national level. And I think that issue has never been done and is something that has to be done if we want to really move forward to uh, where we want to reach a democratic and also a peaceful and a fair society. One, w- one would say the nation has to also admit that there is a problem here and that we need to admit that there has been problems that were lingering in the background and the focus has not been on it for a long time. I, I appreciate your extensive explanation on that point. Uh, you've touched on, uh, in the security um, question, uh, the Al-Shabaab role in Somalia and, and, and the problems that entails. Um, there has to be a plan other than the fighting of them. Um, Al-Shabaab, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, is a Somali entity uh, by large. Um, we've been trying a couple of decades, almost a decade now fighting them. Has, is there an alternative way of dealing with Al-Shabaab um, alongside the military? Yes, there is uh, Al-Shabaab. There are two issues or two, uh, there are uh, really the, the base of Al-Shabaab is it's based on two important issues that have never been challenged. That's why it's difficult for to uproot them and deal with them effectively. The number one issue why Al-Shabaab has the strength and the resilience it has is number one, there is no justice in Somalia. There is absolutely uh, no fair judicial system in Somalia. The, the judiciary system in Somalia is highly corrupt. I was a minister for 18 months on the government of Hassan Khayre and Fermajo at the beginning. And I have seen it at a close hand. The ju- As you know, the government is based on three pillars, the judiciary, the legislative, and also the executive. One leg of that tripod is gone, which is the judiciary. So if people cannot get uh, justice and they cannot get security from the government, then as you know, Somalis are clan-based and the predominant clans of each region try to subjugate the other minor clans and minorities and also people of Bantu and you know farmers. So if the dominant clans are now using force to subjugate those other people, there is a place you have to go to get relief and justice. And that's Al-Shabaab. And Al-Shabaab tells them, you have a corrupt government in Mogadishu, highly corrupt, uh, highly unaccountable to the Somali people. They don't care about you. The only people who can give you justice and look after you is us. Please give us your sons and we will give you the uh, justice that have been denied to you. That's how they recruit. And it's the number one recruiting, uh, you know, real issue. The second related issue that has never been addressed is the issue of poverty, poverty and unemployment, extremely high unemployment. So with that kind of unemployment and people cannot feed their family and the government is not offering any solution, then Al-Shabaab also uh, steps in here again. And what they tell them is, look, uh, they are using uh, coercion and uh, all kinds of tactics, you know, to make get money from the people through extortion. And they are using those resources again to tell them, uh, we will give you $100 a month, uh, but so that you and your family can have their livelihood or an element of you know, livelihood. In exchange, why don't you just give us your sons uh, so that they can also work with us? Unless you address those two issues, which have never been addressed in Somalia, you will never resolve the issue of al-Shabaab. So my view is that is where in my candidacy, we want to put a judiciary system that's reformed, independent and fair. And also we want to create jobs. As you know, I'm an economist by, by profession. I'm a PhD and I used to work at the World Bank for 15 years and eight years at Wall Street. That is my strength of area. And I think I have a plan and it's in our website of how to create jobs for the country. And uh, I can elaborate that for you if, uh, if, if you want to, but that uh, is I, the other issue that has to be addressed. Right. Um, uh, finally, um, 
among dealing with those issues um, is also um, the role of the international community in Somalia. Now, it is um, obvious the hard work that the international community had uh, in principle, you know, uh, afforded Somalis to make their livelihoods better and their, uh, to rebuild the country. But also, it's, uh, there are a lot of criticism in the role that the international community has been playing, uh, especially the last 10 years. Um, and the leadership of the country seems uh, to um, have, in a way, not really figured out a, a way to work with the international community as a, as a sovereign country, one would say. What is your plan and how do you plan to work with the international community to safeguard Somalia, not only the international community's interests, but Somalia's international uh, uh, interest, national interests? Uh, uh, I I see it really uh, by and large, by and large, the interests of the international community and the interests of Somalia are more or less the same. That's how I view it. And what is that? What what is that? Uh, what is the interest of Somalia and international community? It should be a stable Somalia that is secure and peace with its neighbor and also with itself, and also with its regions, as you know. Uh, Ethiopia, which is our neighbor, is now going through implosion. There is almost a civil war that's taking place in Ethiopia. And it's vital and critical, in my view, that a stable Somalia is important for the Horn of Africa and East Africa. And it, we are all, the stakes are very high for Somalis and the international community. And what it boils down to is having the security of Somalia, a credible uh, military that is also professional, that is also have the resource it needs, and the international community and Somalia working together after we uh, deal with that issue, you know, maybe jointly deal that and also uh, corruption and economic development. I'm very confident that we are able to find a, 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 a credible uh, way of moving forward, but we have to have benchmarks. We have to establish expectations you know, what are we expecting from each other? Somalis have to uh, reform and be able to have leaders that fight corruption, that are also uh, working closely with the regions. The country is, it, there's no period where we are more disunited today for a long time in Somalia. So the unity of the country is very important. We need a healer, a leader that brings together all the regions, the federal government, international community and all the other uh, stakeholders in the community, whether they are youth, uh, women, uh, business community, uh, uh, the agenda is really very clear. And uh, I think that is uh, my broader vision of how we can work together. The international community is not monolithic, as you know, they have different interests among themselves and they compete. And sometimes their interests collide. And that's a reality that anybody who looks at Somalia uh, uh, is very much aware of. But I would hope that at least on the key issues, that there would be a consensus and the international community will have a, a, a consensus on their part of what the issues that they are all united on that front. And that is the issues I talked about, the national security, the development, and also for Somalia also uh, to now uh, be able to go to the international community. And also uh, when we get the debt forgiveness, we will be getting uh, hopefully in the next uh, year or so, 2022, uh, we will be able, the World Bank can give them uh, uh, either credits and loans directly where we, they could do the funding for development projects. And we are almost there. So I see a lot of silver lining and a lot of positive things. Somalis, as you know, are entrepreneurs. They are the best entrepreneurs in Africa. And I'm very confident if we have stability and peace and security in Somalia, the economic engine of Somalia would be investments coming from Somalis from the diaspora in East Africa, in Europe. And also there will be uh, other foreign direct investments. If there is law and order and the rule of law prevails, and we have a credible judiciary system in Somalia. And these are really the key ingredients for stable Somalia, prosperous Somalia. And also we want to uh, 
uh, work with our neighbors. Uh, as you know, the climate change is really affecting the entire region and the whole world. We want to have a, a unified uh, understanding and consensus among the regions in East and Horn of Africa and develop a national research center where we can deal with the climatic issues that are affecting the entire region. So, and also Somalia could join the East Africa community that it used to be a member of uh, in the 19, in the 80s or 70s when Somalia created the, the East Africa community was really formed. Uh, there are other issues that are also economically related, which is like Somalia have to print a new currency. And the dollar economy is uh, hampering the uh, lower, uh, really, most of the Somalis who do, do not have access to dollars, uh, they need to leave one dollar, and that one dollar I should be able to get a small change in Somali currency where they can buy so many things for their livelihood. So uh, I'm, I got my PhD in monetary economics, that's what I specialize in. And I was part of the economic committee of the uh, government when I was there. And we already, I traveled with the IMF and the World Bank, and we already have a plan to execute for the issuing new currency. And the money that we required for that, which is about $50 million, is now part of a package we get from the World Bank, which is almost half a billion for developing Somalia. So we have the resources. So those are the issues. So I'm very, on that front, I'm somewhat very optimistic. Uh, on that front. I appreciate it that Abdurrahman Mohamed Hashi, uh, uh, Somalia's, uh, one of Somalia's many, as you mentioned, uh, presidential candidates for this 2020-2021 uh, election coming up. Uh, I appreciate you and thank you immensely for your time and your explanation and, and sharing your expertise with our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.